We made it. Sorry. I'm uh I am occupied quite a bit. Uh, I don't know, sir. Just a good that's um, perfect. But... Yeah. No, but I, I've talked to you know to basically everyone who you played with or you've been playing with the last 40 years, you know, from Ellery Esplin to uh, Mark Elias and Ray Anderson and Herb Robertson and you know all these guys, and it's just like uh, I really wanted to talk to you to kind of put the puzzle there. <laughs> like, you know, Barry Guy, I don't know, Simon Nabat, of all these guys that I really love. And um, and I, I just wanted to ask you one thing to start with. Uh, you've been in Switzerland for quite a long time. And, uh, you know, you've played with basically everyone in the States regarding, let's say, improvised music, almost everyone. And uh, also in Europe, you know, and I listened, let's say, to the Barry Guy albums you've done recently with him. And uh, how was your first perception when you came to Europe? Was there a distinction you felt between European improvisation, let's say, and U.S. improvisation or not really? Well, I first <clears throat> started to seriously encounter improvisation in Europe um, around 1983 and 1984, when I first came over um, primarily to do solo concerts, but also thanks to my then new friend, Aaron Streisinger, I had an opportunity mm -hmm. to co-mingle with the Dutch scene. Um, and in, 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 it's rather remarkable in one evening, I think I met just about everybody um, from that scene. They all said, Aaron's kind of advertised, you got to check this guy out. And they all showed up and they all stayed at the bar and barely listened to anything I played. But we did get a chance to <laughs> to talk and, and they, of course, listened a little bit. And, and you know, it was, a, it was the beginning of what would then be a long relationship with the Dutch um, community. Yeah. It was a vibrant community and a really interesting one. And I got to know it step by step, player by player, um, as well as other things that came my way as I um, became more active performing in Europe. The activity performing in Europe had two streams at first. One was the solo performing, which I was very focused on at the time. And as well, right at the same time, I had begun performing with the Anthony Braxton Quartet. Mm -hmm. So those two things circulated me in the European scene in all countries. And by, by way of that, I got a chance to, to meet some of the musicians um, in various ports. And, um, and slowly those, and they got, well, maybe I should put it another way. They got to meet me by hearing me play. Yeah. Um, uh, Michelle Vinch, who lives here in Switzerland, and Georg Greve both remarked that, you know, they, they got to know me because they came to hear me play either with Braxton or with bass trombone or other things that were taking on um, activity as the, uh, as, the, as the years progressed. Yeah. But I started, as I said, around 83, and I became, I was quite active in those two streams I mentioned at first, those were the main things I was doing. <clears throat> and then a little later in the 80s, uh, bass trombone began touring yeah. in Europe um, more actively um, and um, <clears throat> other projects as well came into play. Um, but I would, I, I would begin my own touring of my own band um, around 1989. That would be yeah. the time when I would be working with that. And the band, the quintet that I began with, um, had several different formations at first. The very first record out of which Crossing, it's, it's, yeah. it's an American-based band. It's, it's kind of has bass trombone with two extra players, except that the one figure in the band that's not part of it is Ernst. Ernst Reisinger was playing cello on the first record. And uh, 
he was coming to the States quite a lot at that time, performing in different situations, but yeah. also with me as well. And so that, um, that was the beginning of the quintet. In 1985, we made a recording. And then you know, around 80, 80, 88 or 89, we began, or actually a little earlier, we began performing in the States, in New York, at the Knitting Factory and places yeah. like this. And um, that band quickly evolved, it started to change uh, players until uh, there was a period of, uh, the first major tour was uh, um, with Don Byron in the, in the seat. The really? I didn't know that. Oh, uh, really? Oh, man. Yeah, the, the first the first record for the well, okay, the first record has David Mott. He's from he's from Toronto, Canada. Actually, he's an American, but he's lived most of his life in Toronto, Canada. Yeah. And um, uh, he he was playing only baritone saxophone um, at that in that case. Ray was playing trombone and Ernst Cello and Mark Elias bass. So this was the formation. And then the second formation was with uh, Ed Schuler on bass. Don Byron was playing both clarinet and baritone saxophone, which is hmm. uh, uh, really interesting because he didn't, I mean, he came back to it and eventually he started yeah. playing ten and much later. But at that time he had been, you know, as a clarinet player, he had been sort of practical and had picked up the baritone saxophone as a way of getting work. and. Every, you know, baritone saxophone players get work because there's not that many of them. And so he he was, that was something that he played at the time, but he really played it well. And I, I love the way he played baritone. And um, we were really involved with each other doing many different projects at that time in the mm -hmm. late 80s. And um, so he was in the band as well, Ed Schuler and Ernst again, and now Walter Birbos, who was- uh, Oh yeah, then, yeah, he became- yeah. He, joined, he joined the band at this point as well. And the only players that remained fixed were Ernst and Walter, and eventually Don was replaced by Michael, Michael Moore, yeah. and uh, that there that became his. He he held that part of the band for for quite a long period of time, and this band stayed relatively stable. And then Mark Dresser yeah. became the bassist. Yeah, it was one so, Demon, um, Demon Chaser. I love that one. Such a record, I think. right? That's, yeah, the, that's, that's the beautiful. second. Uh, had art record but the first had art record the one that has dawn on it is uh, called special detail which is yeah album. yeah that one has um yeah that, that the band i mentioned before it's with with them and that was the first time i brought the group over to europe and um so it's it, yeah it, it was just starting tour was very there weren't that many concerts but we were sure. able to make it happen and we were able to get it recorded and and Werner Eulinger took an interest in the project. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I know you, you've been so active, you know, as a band leader since, you know, Kwamba, which is like 1978, 79-ish. Correct, yeah, 78. Yeah. I mean, that's like, that's a long time ago. And, you know, if... Yeah, I was 23 years old. Yeah, that's incredible. <laughs> And, and then since then you've been incredibly prolific and which is amazing, you know, under your own name and, you know, with bass, drum and bone and of course as a side, side man. And, but uh, I wanted to ask you like one quite, I think it's quite an interesting, uh, I, I haven't read anything about it yet, about Oracle Records, you, you did Kwambe on your own. And I think you were probably one of the first musicians. I know, I mean, I talked with Tim Byrne about that. He, he did it on his own already in the late 70s, but it was not many of you. How did you decide to do that? And how was it for you back then to actually do it on your own? Because now it's kind of easier with all the, you know, stuff that we have and availability. But, uh, it was exceptionally difficult, or at least it was an adventure. I'll put it that way. Um, yeah, Tim, Tim and I, we were friends at that time we we'd met each other and, and we were you know starting our companies more or less at the same time but so were many others um i mean my model i had many models to to base this on, on uh, leo smith who uh, without yeah. leo smith who was my neighbor in new haven connecticut and oh, wow. so he had started his own label um quite a few years before uh cabell and there were many examples around me of of artists taking independent action to produce their music. So by the point that I 
put that out, there was already quite a bit of precedent for um, artist run labels. Mm. There was also New Music Distribution Service, which was based in New York and associated with the Jazz Composers Orchestra, would yeah. have uh, known for Carla Blay and others, Michael Mantler. And, um, but anyways, the New Music Distribution Service, um, I believe Jim Igo was also involved in this at the early, early stages. The, that created a real, we could actually bring our LPs uh, to, the, to, to them as a distribu distributor. They had a place to store them and they were able to sell them. And so my records got around and I also independently looked up and found where to send records to get reviews in yeah, some stores that were spread throughout the, the world, including some in Germany, some in, I just, you know, I did a little research on it and I it was, it was my first calling card, the record Kwambe. Um, sure. It established myself as a, as a composer. The, the group that you hear on the record is, is kind of a, well, there's, there's several groups. There are a number of yeah. groups. Bass drum is actually on the record. And it's yeah. very, very, Recording. Um, we had only just really begun to play together. Also, a trio with George Lewis and Anthony Davis, and then this larger group. And the larger group, which was a quintet, was pretty closely aligned to Anthony Davis's quartet of, of yeah. that same time. And and, uh, and and Anthony was my one of my great models for um, yeah, he was for, for, for not not necessarily band leading per se, but just composing for other musicians and making things happen as a, as a group and, and, this, and this kind of thing. So I, in a way, the record reflects everything that I had benefited from up till that point, the first well, record. Well, how, how did you feel that, that moment that you're actually ready to do that? I mean, to become a band leader or, I mean, now you seem like really comfortable, of course, and you grow comfortable. I would hope so. Yeah, come on. <laughs> no, like, you know, this first record, how did you know, when was the moment that you decided, like, okay, I want to do that now under my own name? And... Well, the, the group, we had a group in New Haven, Connecticut, which is where I'm actually from, but the other musicians whom I, were, I was associated with were mostly involved with Yale University yeah. um, and or um, Wesleyan University, which wasn't far away. And these two universities attracted really interesting um, musicians who were studying at the time. Mark Elias came yeah. to the Yale School of Music to study classical composition and, and other things. Uh, um, he was a great bass player and we were benefiting greatly from his sure. arrival. Even. Um, but there were others, Wes Brown, uh, another bassist who lived in Middletown, and, and Anthony Davis was living there. George Lewis was going and taking well, was studying yeah, philosophy at Yale University, and there were uh, yeah, quite a quite, uh, Robert Dick was also involved in the music uh, scene in, in Yale. There was a huge and actually, when we look back now at the community, Bobby Naughton, Mario Pavone, there were lots of interesting players oh, all in, in this uh, nestled around the New Haven scene, more or less. And um, so there were many models of, of people taking, you know, take, taking music into their own hands, making things happen, creating initiatives, presenting concerts. I also, by the, by the time we got to the, the time I made that record, I was already a concert presenter in, in New Haven. Oh, I was wow, a, really? a concert series at the Educational Center for the oh. Arts, getting grants. I, we had lots of different things going on. And we were very you know, shooting, shooting hard and trying to get things to happen at that early stage. So I think my sense of when to, to make this record was just because I had the opportunity with, um, with the Anthony Davis Quartet to try my music out, to bring yeah. my pieces in. Mark Elias did the same. He was also a member of that group. And, um, and we brought our pieces in and we, try, we kind of worked semi like a collective, although Anthony was generally leading the group and it was mostly his compositions but on the other hand we did we did get a chance to do our own stuff and experiment a lot i can remember a really nice project with a guitarist nobody remembers but he was there at the time his name was steve wald i believe um i think Wes brown was playing bass with leo smith anthony mm -hmm. davis george lewis and i made this really really strange piece i never released it or anything but it was a very it was i just had the chance to experiment and mind you, we were all in, under a little bit under the influence of, of 
of Leo Smith as we knew him then, Wadada Leo Smith now, who had brought some of the methodologies of the AACM to our yeah. community. So we had since our own experimental band, the experimental band was the key element of the AACM. I don't know how well you know your history in Chicago, yeah, sure. but it, in 1965, they were, uh, that was a, they had several different um, uh, incarnations. Incarnations, right? uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, but the uh, uh, you know, when we, we started a similar th situation and we would get together and try each other's music and experiment so with different important. ideas. Yeah. Absolutely. And of course, Braxton, who lived up in Woodstock at this time, which was about maybe two hours or so from Haven, would occasionally come down and join us for these experimental ensembles. And that's how I first met him. Oh, and, uh, and also, I mean, he became aware of the New Haven community of musicians and became interested in them. Mm. You, you, you mentioned, that, you know, you played each other's compositions and uh, how did you start writing these compositions? When was the first compositions you wrote, I guess, as a teenager and based on what? I mean, how did that happen? Like, I mean, now it's easier that, that we know the tools, you know, but like in the beginning, how, how did that happen for you? So, well, that's a good question. Um, I autodidacticism was was in the air or in the water <laughs> i mean we all just did it i mean we didn't hesitate um and we all went for it and i think in different ways we had different tools at our disposal so for instance um i was i, I have to say mostly inspired by both Wadada and, and anthony davis i saw how they did their music i observed how they made their pieces yeah. I, I learned from them. I learned from the experience and I learned from the experience of like working together to make the music come alive and make it into, into something interesting to listen to. <clears throat> and by way of that, I, I, I got, of course, I, I, I didn't exactly imitate, but, but yes, of course, you, you borrow the ideas that are around yeah. you and you experiment with them yourself. I had, I had musical training. I had, I had some musical theory when I was in high school. I, I knew how to read music a, a little bit. I was semi you know um together on our musical theory stuff but i honestly had lots and lots and lots to learn and i just experimented i just tried and yeah. failed and tried and sometimes succeeded and um it it um there i mean i have a, a file cabinet full of compositions that that we that were from that time i mean I oh wow man there's tons oh. and tons of work because I try, I had many different groups, many different combinations, lots of different projects, I made lots of things happen. Yeah, yeah well, we, 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 we would we were would love to see those. Actually, it's, uh, I always love well, seeing I'll this say, handwritten stuff. And yeah, there's the scores on the one hand, but on the other hand, there's also uh, I I was uh, had a side hobby of, of recording engineering, and so I recorded so much of this music of that time oh, wow. on real tape. I'm working on getting that archive digitized. Um, uh, along with Firehouse 12 in New Haven. Um, yeah. And they have the archive at the moment, but we're having, we're struggling a bit to get the right uh, tape recorder to play it back. And, and that therefore my own tape recorder, unfortunately has, has, um, has, has reached its age of <laughs> departure. So <laughs> the, recorder, the recording machine that I um, actually made the recordings on, we, we worked with it for a while, but it fell apart. So we have to find something else. Um, it's quarter track machinery, so it's a little bit more difficult to find. But at any rate, the, um, um, the, there's a lot of documentation, not only in, um, of course, some of our, I, I'm, I'm an archivist and a historian, and this, I slowly, yeah. over time, I, I took care for my own archive, but I also looked after others as well. And um, so, yeah, there's quite a bit of data that eventually will surface in one form or another. Um, yeah. hope uh, over time yeah I, I would love to hear it, it it's like you, you know I, I hear about all, all these incredible sessions you guys did in the 70s or like you know Dave Liebman or all these guys start, are telling me about the loft scene and you know you oh, know how these sessions were going on and it's like I wish there were recordings of that probably maybe there are but you know like these sessions yeah. must have been incredible yeah. right yeah, the, the, I mean, I have to say, I, it, it is fortunate I do have this archive of New Haven in that time. Yeah, it's it's true. There was, of course, there was lots that it's 
went into the air and that's it then what can we do but but it, there eventually we will be able to hopefully put in for scholarship uh, you know some of these some of the documentation that, that we that we have and there was in new haven one other thing that should be mentioned <clears throat> that was quite important was the Creative Musicians Improvisers Forum. This was a sister or brother organization to the AACM. We've kind of followed the same um, um, organizational yeah, or yeah. pattern, or yeah, you could say. Um, uh, <clears throat> it was with myself. Uh, myself, uh, Wadada was the, the chairman of it, of course, and Bobby Norton was involved, and Wes Brown was involved. The four of us did all the legal work to set the whole thing up, and then. Um, we eventually, the, the organization had, I don't know, maybe 20 or 30 members at a certain point, lots of different musicians. Um, and we would get together as a large ensemble called the Creative Improvisers Orchestra. And I don't know whether you've ever come across it, but it's a record called The Sky Cries the Blues. No, on CM check this out. Record. no. that's a really interesting record. That's a large ensemble recording. And I have a composition on that. And that's, that's oh. from um, around 1980 or so. And also Bobby Norton does, and Leo has one as well. Hmm, have to see, what's the name of it? The, the Sky? It's called, it's called The Sky Cries the Blues. Okay. And it's I'll try on CMIF Records. It's an mm -hmm. LP. And I, I'm fairly certain if you hunt the internet, you will find it somewhere. Um, uh, and if not, I, I can... Yeah. I'll try. I'll try searching. I love, I love that. I'm quite a geek in this regard, like reading and... yeah just about the history of you know improvised music and how it was happening well that's an interest that's a that's a that's a lovely document we we, we uh, oliver lake was involved in this as well he used to come really? up to new haven quite a bit because he played a lot with uh Wadada at that time so he was involved and others were yeah it's, it was a lovely lovely project and uh, it's still a lovely record I, I i heard it once recently and i went this, this is not bad <laughs> we did some interesting stuff so uh yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, it sounds fresh. I mean, I, I, I talked with Mark Elias about that and, you know, even the early bass drum bone stuff sounds so fresh even now, if you put it on, you know, like it starts with gyro. I think it's Mark's tune that like mm -hmm. odd meterish, and you put it on now and it sounds basically what's happening almost in New York now, you know, like this odd metered stuff going into a free section and it still sounds really modern. I mean, and it's, 40 years old, more. That's so beautiful about that music. Yeah, I mean, uh, that, that group in particular has, a, right from the start, in fact, um, had a unique uh, chemistry. Mm. Um, if you really peruse the bass trombone webpage, there is one, yep. um, basstrombone.com. If you look really hard, it might take a minute to find it. I'm pretty sure I posted the very first time we played together as a group. Um, there, one piece that I'm pretty sure it's somewhere in the historical data of the of the site. Um, I tell the story of the of the, of the first performance in the liner notes of the most recent CD called "The Long The Long Road." Road. Yeah. And, um, but um, the actual piece is, I think, available on the webpage somewhere if you hunt around. And there you actually, I mean, we literally, it was the very first time we played as a trio and we'd only gotten together an hour before the concert and just, but this chemistry thing was just, just there. And, and we have, it just happened and it, it always clicked. And um, as the energy went from there, you know, it started, it started in a place of, of you know, this makes a lot of sense and we just had a we had a ball playing with each other yeah it's incredible it's it's you know now, now still, in, it, yeah that's what i mean it's in jazz that's so it's quite rare i, I spoke once on a tour with paul mccandless and, and i think it was oregon was one of the longest working i don't know if they still exist you know jazz groups and i bass drum and bone must have been somewhere there actually you know it's like more than 40 years you guys have been playing so we are 45 years old yeah. this year modern and jazz that maybe was there i don't think there is too many groups that may yeah. remain unchanged entirely with no That's alterations First, nobody died nobody you know whatever we're still all here and it's it, it's gone for 45 years so that that's it that is something uh, um we hope that <laughs> others will care about it and we'll be able Absolutely. to both make concerts 
concerts and make an interesting recording. It, it, things are in the midst, uh, are, are starting to take uh, shape for what we're gonna do this year in Fantastic. celebration of that first Yeah, I, I wanted to ask you about bass, drum and bone. When, what does it mean for you as a drummer on the one hand and as a composer on the other hand to play with a group, let's say for 40, 45 years? I mean, of course, on the one hand, you know the players like, you know, you cannot know them better, but how do you surprise yourselves and them to make it interesting for you guys? And you as a composer, how do you deal with this situation? I mean, on the long road, you know, you wrote some beautiful music for this band. And well, I mean, it's like more questions in this, if you can uh, share some thoughts about that. Well, I mean, yeah, that's that you raised an important point. Um, some situations can kind of find themselves sort of having completed their possibilities, but it seems, um, I think one of the things that happens is, I mean, there are gaps between when we get together and play. Mm, yeah, sure. And I think each one of us individually is interested in, um, I mean, we're seeking all the time. It's some, some, something of the nature of where we come from. We come from the age of experimentalism. You know, if we go back one more time to the 70s period um, you know, and or late 60s period, this was a vibrant period of, of experimentalism in the arts in general and music in particular. And um, I think that spirit has always been with us um, and or uh, individually in different ways it's taken shape. And so um, I think that a lovely thing that happens when we get together and work with each other's pieces is we have a very kind of, I don't know how to put it, but exactly kind of supportive way of, of, of helping each other. Like sometimes the pieces aren't like all together there and or I've, or maybe let's say in my case, I've written something that's just too, doesn't fit well, or so, there might be something to work, work out. And that's and that's something we can do in a collective way, yeah. which is a, a, a through through rehearsing and exp and again through experimenting and trying things. But we, I mean, the the, the essential ingredient of the group is a is is a remarkable um, sense of trust that we can each venture where our. Um, uh, intuition wishes to go and, and um, in, in, in independent ways yeah. create conflict and resolution and really some, you know in in very fluid uh, uh, manner and yeah it it's still there and and uh, I'm uh, yeah I mean the we, we played a lot we found yeah. there was a period where we were very active and played hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of gigs together and um, it it so there's this, there's this, you know, we know these things that are are in our system, in our sound, in our, our in our conception. It's an unusual, um, you know, it's a kind of special instrumentation. Yeah. Um, um, a trombone is essentially a tenor instrument, or a little bit, sometimes a little lower and a little bit, and in Ray's case, quite a bit higher than tenor. But um, and you have the bass, and you have a bass who has a, you know, Mark has this remarkable range. He has yeah. ability as an arco player. And I'm a very, I have a lot of options as, yeah. a, as a drummer. I can do many, many different things. And so there is orchestrational possibility that opens many, you know, many, many, many ways that we can uh, create music that I somehow, I, it's, I, I think the long road demonstrates quite well. We have, we can keep a, uh, it's, it's, incredible. it's a beautiful record too. Yeah. Oh, there are a lot of records, or if you go back to uh, a lot of them are on the Bandcamp page that I've put up. Yeah, but some of them are on Marks and some of them are on mine. And yeah, there is some. I mean, go back to check them out again. I'm oh, I'm I'm also myself rather <laughs> surprised by what I hear. I go, yeah, yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> there's a great there's a great dynamic in this group. Yeah, and a great understanding and yeah. a lot of love. I have to say. Now you feel that I mean on the long road. I also I wanted to ask you about you composing for this group and uh, you know your compositions camp. Let's say it's like has these accents. Then you have the tone uh, tonal 
it's like almost like Paul, Paul Motionish in my vibe. I kind of see this use of space, but like, how do you envision composing for this trio or in general? How do you write it? So, because some are really complex. Some are like a couple of notes, you know, simple. So what's the process there? Do, do you have Ray and Mark in your mind when you do that? that? Or just are you? Uh, sh sure, in terms of writing for bass trombone. Yeah. Specific, I write mostly specifically for players. I, Bruce, I'm of okay. the Ellington school. Ellington vibe, yeah. About, okay. Yeah, the players who will play the pieces and interpret them. This That's is so very, cool. very true of my quintet. Um, uh, they're, they're the system of compositional organization was um, deeply entrenched in the very special skills of the players that I had. Yep. But the same is also true of bass trombone. Um, I, um, yeah, I mean, well, I've, I've composed, I mean, I started, as I said, in this rather, um, just jumped in the water and said, oh, if I want to know how to compose, I'm going to start composing and I'll figure it out, you know. And, and from that point forward, I've never stopped really. I mean, I've been composing all my life. I don't know. I've, yeah. I've lost uh, when I look at my gamma list, it's really, really long. I mean, I, <laughs> um, I've done a lot over the years. And um, yeah, you just, I mean, I, and I've been teaching it for years as well. I understand a lot about composition and I've yeah. studied a lot. I mean, I, as I got older, I got more interested in sophisticated um, analysis and went in, you know, went back to Viennese school and looked at that and did other things that I needed yeah. to understand. Looked at Bach and I looked at classical music, but looked at also a, a deeply and all manner of jazz history. I mean, I've been fa fascinated by it by Ellington. Tonell is a is a actually a very a sly reference to Ellington. I yeah. mean, it's um, with having uh, Jason Moran added to the mix, I had an option to to play with colors and textures that um, are a little bit more expansive than is possible with bass trombone. Yeah. Just the three of them. We have this quartet. Wow. Okay. So my idea of that was to to use a kind of sense because Ellington has has massive influence on 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 me as well as Mingus. I would say those two oh, are, really? are, wow. are really the the key key composers. Mingus is where I started from. Mingus was my model for for writing. Really? Oh, I, I didn't know that. Well, More than anybody else, Mingus was my guy. You know, and, oh. and uh, I am so um, I'm glad that in my lifetime I got to meet him and I got to shake his hand and thank him for what he did for me. Uh, that was so oh. great for me. Um, and um, Ellington, who I actually got to hear perform when I was a teenager uh, in 1972. <laughs> um, I actually heard the band, Johnny Hodges. And everything. Oh, man, really? Oh, man. Yeah. You're the actual Ellington man. But that Ellington has remained, you know, has become more, and over time has become a real important. I mean, of course, there are all the others that, you know, Monk and many others who are, are all part of the equation as well. Sure. But I would say those two have, have the most impact on me and i would say that in general the blues as a as a as a form and as a as a, a, a whole expression of life on our planet is the other major factor in most of my writing really interesting wow okay well, well, also, I, mean, I mean if, if i had to cite hmm. things that were significant i would i would go for those uh, first well i mean uh, I, I love what you did with michelle and bands with Strayhorn and Ellington arrangements, man. Yes. The oh, I love that project. I'm, I'm I mean, we're, it was, uh, and Michelle's so initiative beautiful. originally, oh, oh. I, I mean, you should hear what we've come up with now. I'm, <laughs> it keeps going. I mean, and it's Are really, you? there's a, I recommend highly the, um, there's a, a, a recently posted on my uh, YouTube channel, I put up finally this um, concert at, at AMR, AMR. Oh, in, wow, okay. Uh, and that concert, that's a great example of what the band is capable of. So I, I recommend listening to it very highly. Awesome. Um, Noah, the Ellington Strayhorn project with the Who Trio is a super delight, I have to say. And that is maybe a, an interesting topic. You you mentioned that you were interested to talk about the where improvisation and composition meet. And you yeah. can't pick a project than that one because there you have a, um, a sense of 
Okay, so the, to give a sense of how the project evolved, we spent about a year and a half getting together and really learning these tunes and, you know, uh, so that they were in our system deeply. And that meant playing them traditionally and exploring them, and listening yeah. to them and listening to versions of them and studying them and buying them and seeing what can be done. And it just began slowly and gently. And we found, you know, hmm, interesting piece, you know. <laughs> and we began to look at all the things that could be potentially done. But but it's but we kind of discovered that the that the material, kind of like monk's material, it has the same quality. It's sort of indestructible. It has such it has such um, uh, power. Even motifs, yeah. even the first Chelsea Bridge, anything like that. It's just got you have a sense of place already, and with very little taken from the uh, um, actual piece. So one thing led to another, and we began to really use our improvisational language. And at, the po at this point, when we do a concert and the AMR concert's a good example of that, there's no arrangement of anything ahead of time. There, is, there, is, there are these 30 or so pieces in our, our repertoire we could bring out at any one given time. And sometimes more than one happen at the same time. And sometimes we play one and come back to it later. And you know, it, it, anything mm. is all over. But the main thing is that the material is with great love. I must say, first of all, is is given a different kind of um, it, it's a wedding of two languages. It's a wedding of an improvisational language that it, in and of itself has had 20 years to yeah. grow. And um, and and the beautiful and wonderful and mature and and remarkable and, uh, uh, melodies and harmonies and, and songs of, of Ellington and Strayhorn. And they are they yeah they make they make for very interesting material i think it's a relatively unique project i've never heard anybody yeah. else approach i mean approach traditional music like this I, I wanted to ask you like let's say you know we all play them i mean i played take the a train and in a sentimental mood to the thousands of times and i heard them on jam sessions in the most boring you know in a sentimental mood like people just play it to blow or like take the A train, and you do such unique versions. I haven't heard, you, you know, when I saw that you did take the A train, I was like, man, how, how are you going to deal with this? You know, because it's, we have, you know, the swingy version in our minds or in a sentimental mood, but it's just like, man, how did you, you know, how, how did you come up with the arrangements that you did them like that? How did? That's the magic of the group. I mean, mm. that's. That's that that that's twenty years of playing together. That's yeah. that's like bass trombone. That's deep trust. That's like yeah. that's the nature of improvisation when it reaches a, a maturity and a, and a and a possibility. You got to work on it. I mean, look, yeah, it's sure. it's bass trombone was has the advantage of having had so many concerts and so many performances and so many chances to work yeah. and play yeah. with its material. And who who if we didn't have as many performances, I don't think we're anywhere near as many performances, but we've got to get, we get together and play. And now that I live here in the same country as they do, we have the opportunity to get together whenever we can. And, and we do. And we still just, you know, see what goes on. It's an yeah. important part of, of, of making music. And I, I believe I, I work in a number of groups that yeah. exclusively improvise music and they, and we rehearse we we don't just get together and see what happens. We actually get together and explore uh, in our for ourselves, yeah. uh, not public. Just see what goes on. So this is part of I think a, a, a newer attitude towards improvised music, which I think is important. And uh, also is that the uh, the whole <clears throat> uh, uh, genre of of improvised music is growing in a in a way yeah. as I observe at least now at least mm -hmm. here in europe because now i'm kind of eurocentric at this point but uh, amongst many things that i see particularly here where i am there's a great deal of thought and consideration and care and time put into the possibility of what can happen when players get together and bring their voices and their ideas and their their sense of things together i was yeah. just doing a session today as a matter of fact uh, 
um, with um, a player who was once my student and one of my colleagues at school. And lovely, lovely, deep experimental work with electroacoustic stuff. Oh, wow. really beautiful, cool. beautiful. I mean, uh, I wanted to ask you here, like when you improvise, how do you get rid of, it's a tough question, for, but for, for me, like how do you get rid of, uh, how do you loosen yourself up and be free in a way that you're really free? Because sometimes, do you get stuck sometimes or do you feel sometimes that, how do you overcome, you know, these barriers in free improvisation? Of course, when we play it with other players, we have their language we can grasp on, but still this moment of free liberation of not taking some techniques i will play this now because i can like how do you achieve that in free improvisational context it's a lot of work <laughs> that's a good answer actually that's it yeah. <laughs> it's a lot of work and i i think that i think there's nothing automatic in life and and, and improvisation shows us that if you really want to deal with this, perhaps we could call high art or very sophisticated Definitely. form of music, it's um, it's serious business. I mean, it's not it's not easy um, uh, to to really get to a point that you describe where one is in a, a flow with so much possibility and really yeah. can go just about anywhere. And but it's but and you're not stuck with your own cliches and you're not stuck yeah. with like relying on and cool sounds and or you know all kinds of others there are many traps i mean there are a zillion traps but, but it's it's um i can say a lot about that i mean i think one of the ways you get there is that you you study you listen a lot to the history i listen to um well you can see from behind, what's behind me i sure. listen to a lot of music i'm i'm a I've always believed in that. Um, my maiden school was um, getting on, soaking up stuff from the radio that, you know, and, and finding out about it and then going to a library and finding the record and or buying it in a store and then listening to it over and over and over again and deeply understanding it or just taking it in, you know, yeah. digesting it. That's one, that's one element that, and then I would say that the other thing that has enriched my, my um, options as a improviser uh, is a mixture of two things. I would say composition in general and solo performance specifically. I did a lot of solo work. I started in 1974. When did you? Oh, 74. Oh, wow. okay. It's when I first um, ventured into this idea of performing. How did you come up to... Yeah, yeah. How did how, who were you inspired by for doing solo drums? Actually, well, again, we're back now. We're back to New Haven one more time. Um, in New Haven, Wadada Leo Smith used to regularly give solo concerts. It was something that he did. His first record, Creative Music One, on Cabell, documents that um, very yeah. similar experience that I got to hear many times um, performed. And my experience of the solo performance was so touching. Um, I also, Braxton had this solo record as well on Delmark and there were yep. other things emerging. I mean, this was relatively new territory. But the AACM, I have to say, was instrumental in, in enlivening this um, um, wonderful area of, of um, musical yep. uh, ability. And I signed on to that really early on and I was I was in I really wanted to, to figure out how to make a, a music for for solo drums and it seemed like a pretty difficult proposition because uh, I didn't really like listening to you know uh, pyrotechnic drum solos particularly I mean I did when I was young of course I, I sure. ran funk but you name it I <laughs> got all the all the you know um, uh, athletics of, of the instrument but I um um, I recognized that by that point that I that there was much more possibility. And when I reached around 1980, when I first made the first solo LP that I produced called Solo Works on my own yep. label again, um, that around that time I began to understand that I could make a language for the instrument, and also really codify extended techniques. Now, extended techniques were relatively new territory yep. back in the days. Uh, symbol scrapes and all kinds of ways of bowing symbols and all kinds of other things like that were were not maybe there was a bit, there was a bit of this well there was a fair amount 
lot of it, but not really explored deeply inside of um, 20th century, at that time it was called 20th century classical music or contemporary classical music. And I heard, of course, a lot of that. And I got some of my ideas from there, from classical music. But I also got a lot of my ideas from world music. I, I studied instruments from Africa. I studied stuff from all over the world. I was busy with South Indian music study at the time. Oh, really? I and didn't know learned before. lots of different things from lots of different sources. I just, I, 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 and I started to integrate them into my thinking. So all these things, all working on solo music kind of forced a lot of issues to take shape. And it also, as an improviser, and this is the important part, okay, I would make these pieces. They would have a kind of fixed progression of things that would happen in a certain order. But when you get on a stage and you start to play, not all those things are gonna necessarily work, either the acoustic or the instrument or other things are kind of maybe possibly because it's a delicate matter. I have like a stick here and a mallet here and it's, everything's gotta be in the right place to pull the thing off. And sometimes it doesn't work out that way. So you've got to be, you have to be fast on your feet. You have to think, you have to be, you have to be alive with the possibility of what's happening in the moment at that, at this time. And as that, as you begin to become more in touch with that, you begin to see, you know, it's not about all my plans, all my possibilities, all my cool sounds, all my techniques, it's not about that at all. It's about what you hear in the moment, what you are able to realize and understand that can happen with whatever is at your disposal and your ability and your sensitivity and your ear and your and your and your and your and your, and your gut and your courage all of yeah. those things are like yeah. all That's so playing important. a role yeah. in, into into what you what action you'll take yeah to get rid of fear that's so important i think always just yeah, I wish I wish it were that. It, I wish it was just that, but it's not. Of course, it, it, you need a lot of information. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. But that's, this is like such you gotta a factor. Have a strong I think. Fiber. It's yeah, yeah, sure. It's it, I found, found it find it interesting many times that if you play a drum solo or or any musician who's like well versed in the tradition, also you know who knows the tradition, it sounds way different than someone who's. I've seen many improvised, not, not only drums, but concerts by players who just started to play improvised music without having the background that we were talking about, you know, listening to Ellington and stuff. And when you play, I, I hear all this stuff of modern classical music of Ellington, of the blues. And and I think that's that's why it sounds, that's why you have all these options also, I guess, what you said now. That's so important. You could, say, you could call them, I have different roots that are, yeah. um, that, that, that give me a foundation to build from. Yeah, um, exactly. I, I, I'll put it another way. Like for instance, I used to used to say a lot um, when I was asked about, everybody was curious about the fact that I was so interested in country music, which I am. I, I, call, I became a bit of a, for a period of time, I became a, really interested in, co in collecting this stuff. And really? Listening to these oh. Voice. oh yes, it was, a, I, I still am. I mean, I still, oh. I still. Uh, what intrigued you? A lot from that, and the reason, the the, the thing that uh, you know, people couldn't quite put together the way I do what I do musically, and, and, and George Jones, where how does that go, go together? And so, um, but there's a lot there, you see, because singers taught me almost everything I know in in some respects. They taught me phrasing, they taught me breath, they taught me timing, they taught me the beauty of meaning inside of each thing that you do, and so. If you want to look, if, if I want to cite one interesting ingredient in my story, that, that's, that's really, that's a, that, that makes, that, that's how I figured out a lot of things. I, 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 I realized, I didn't even know that I was doing that. I was just loving the music and ingesting it. But I, I was, I was, I was not, I was taken by the singers. The singers gave me all, most of the clues about, about. And I, by the way, I also worked with singers. I worked with jazz singers, some pop stuff, and I did other things. Really, I, didn't know. And I, I explored. Um, I, I got the got the feeling for what it's like to play for and accompany uh, a, a singer who could really sing. I learned a lot from from that world. That um, it's for me maybe the most important thing that I I took in and understood over time. Mm, because yeah. there some, because there when a singer conveys a lyric which is mostly what they're doing um they the lyric has meaning the lyric has other things attached to it it has this musical form attached to it it yeah. has this linear line attached to it it has this 
um, um, uh, emo all these emotions um, possibly attached to it. Uh, it has di all different things that yeah. it wishes to share um, and to import and for us to hear and for us to feel. And that, if you want to understand a lot about the way I think when I play, there, if you can make that kind of connection, you'll you'll you'll, you'll kind of get it. I mean, that's that's for me. No, no. A, a, that, that that's a lot. I I know that's in my system. Again, I'm not literally taking country music in any way. I'm no, just, no, it's very it's, it's the principle of these things that I'm interested in, and 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 uh, and, and how and I and also the internalization of those things. I mean, that explains the title to tell a story of your solo works. Because that's oh. where you, you're you're basically trying to tell a story. That's what a country singer does, right? Or any singer, for matter of fact. I mean, yeah. Well, there's another there's another element. There's another there's more to it than just just what I said. Uh, uh, to tell a story, that, that you cite the recent film that yeah. I it was my answer to just to put it in context uh, for for those of you listening to this who don't know what this is. Um, uh, I, of course, we all in, in the lockdown phase of things um, had to contend with what to do and um, um, uh, regarding performance. And I, I, I observed what everybody was doing and I observed the, the various ways in which people were sharing their music. And I felt I wanted to put something of quality and, and depth and, and offer it in some way that wasn't also just posting it and here it is and check it out yeah. no i wanted i wanted to um i wanted to create a, a, a real concert experience but that meant that in order to hold people's attention it could not be simply a camera of me doing you know faced at me while i'm performing it that's just not going to hold people's attention no matter how good i play so um i I endeavored to make a, a real kind of film um, using numerous cameras, and I, it's entirely done by myself. I, I had I did all really? the camera work, all the wow, post wow. and I'm also working with a visual artist for many, many years, and, and her work is integrated into this okay. as well. But the to tell a story part is a, a, a relatively new development, and where I'm headed as a solo artist, um, in that I I. I started sometimes this would pop up in the middle of improvised music concerts where i suddenly start talking um as if i were and in fact i was telling a kind of slice of a tiny bit of a story somehow the music sparked for me a setting and i love for instance uh, there was a i used to go here many times spalding gray he was a wonderful monologist uh, who um was part of the worcester street uh, performance garage and um, in New York, and I, I, I never forgot his thing, and I always was touched by how powerful just telling a story well spoken word can be. Yeah. Yeah. What that could be, you know? And I thought, so, so I thought, I don't, I thought it'd be interesting to explore literally telling stories, but my things are only short for for now. They're relatively short. Um, they're not full stories. Yeah. They're just snippets of something. They're a kind of slice of a moment. And I integrate that into, in, and I'm also trying to figure out, and the, and the film in a way captures this in a, in a way that I'm, I'm, I'm kind of happy with, at least for a beginning, that I'm playing what I'm saying. You see, my hands yeah. are busy with what, uh, doing things. I'm not just speaking, I'm, I'm accompanying myself and or integrating my expression with my hands and what's being played with what I'm saying. Yeah. So yeah. I'm, I'm looking for these literal bridges between the idea of, of narrative or semi-narrative and musical um, expression. Yeah, that's a nice world to explore. I mean, especially, you know, for solo. Yeah, where a, I'm headed, heavy, I think, heavy one, I think yeah. is that where I would like to go with it is a, a, a bit, um, well, it's, it, it would be too much to explain it right now, but I, I have another kind of way of thinking about what I would like to do with solo performing Beautiful. in the future, which is a little bit more, it, it takes me away from the drum set per se, but I, I, I it's too much to explain it right now. We'll get okay. to that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, cool. That, 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 that should be the second interview, like uh, Anthony Braxton and this. So, you know, I will not even touch Anthony, one of my favorite quartets ever. I mean, the Braxton quartet, which you, um, 
of the guys that's you know i listen to that so much so like you said like you wrote in the email we, we can probably talk about this until 3 a.m in the morning about braxton so i mean if I, anthony you know. is his family i love this guy very deeply and we have a we had a really really need to not only the group but but each one of us together we all had a, a very deep yeah. understanding and it was um a unique and special experience i know for him and for all of us at, at that time and something happened or something began to really click in that group that yeah. elevated his music which was the vehicle we were all driving together into something other than just a vehicle it was just yeah. became the level and um it was a, a great a great understanding of four musicians who had many things to give to this situation and had a, under, a great understanding and love for each other so I mean, yeah. the results are there there are many interesting documents of it and yeah, many yet to sure. come yeah. there, there's still um there's still stuff there's the, the london jazz cafe this is meeting oh, really? a oh, whole man. bunch of other things that haven't Beautiful. been put out but um yeah, I, 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 I go back uh, when as a teacher, I sometimes bring those things. I did once oh, wow. a course, course on Braxton and um, since I have a unique perspective and understanding of his music. Yeah, I, I mean, it's interesting to go back for me as well to go back and have a look at these things and um, recognize what, um, what was going on, which was was a rather special experience. I'm, I'm, I'm hugely grateful. It was 11 years of my life and it was a very incredible yeah. Can, can I ask you just here, uh, Jerry, just one small part of this, like how, how did you, you guys, or especially you as a percussionist and drummer in that group, know how to play, <laughs> I mean, it sounds stupid, but like you seem to, to have the right answer to his music and the improvisational settings. Did you guys talk a lot about that or, you know, Anthony's music is very special and his notations and his scores and... Mm how did you know how to deal with it like in the beginning let's say like if you remember the first rehearsals of gigs how, how did you envision your role oh, well it? there's i mean i do have a good story for the for one of the first rehearsals oh please I, if... it was a uh, <laughs> he it was a phrase that would come back from time to time but he we were at his house and he was living at that point he had moved to new haven connecticut and um and at that point point Wadada had moved to California so they, they they never lived it seemed in New Haven at the same time now they do they both live about five miles from each other but <laughs> but at any rate uh, we were at his house uh, it was with Marilyn and um Lindbergh and myself and, and and we were working on these pieces and he said Jerry Jerry what I need is is is, is clouds of garbage cans and he, that's beautifully put. Need this so garbage can. I just loved it. I mean, I was, okay, you got it. <laughs> I mean, how it's look. I, his music is so many. It's dimensional, and I think that it offers. Um, it's, it's not that I didn't come to that group with a lot of experience. I'd had a lot of experience. Mind you, I'd spent a great deal of time in contemporary music. Graphic scores were not um, more yeah. unseen. You know, I'd, I've been dealing with this stuff. I had been doing, i familiar with lots of languages. And I, of course, was familiar with him. I, I checked out his music quite a bit. And, um, but the, but the sense of how to negotiate it as a drummer and well, not just as a drummer, but as a part of a quartet that yeah. was dealing with a multidimensional um, music that had lots of how can we can say modules inside of it and lots of um, parts that had to be composited together. Uh, you had to see yourself as I was growing to understand more and more, particularly in the context of this group you had to see yourself as part of a a, a system of music a, a group of music being made in, in mm -hmm. real time you couldn't you I, on the one hand you had to be an autonomous element you had to work had to make your own decisions had to make certain things happen 
because you had the strength and willpower to do so. But on the other hand, you had to be very liquid and flexible and be able to understand where everything was at and okay. where, where the moments were happening and where the points of connections could occur. And that happened partly through, mostly, mostly through the ear in my case, but not only because in this group, um, I had to, I, my eyes were open more often than I'm usually open because I had to pay attention to a lot of written music at the same time as to watch Anthony's, who often was uh, in regards to, you, you pay attention to where he was and or Marilyn or any one of us could, we had, we had a, a kind of roadmap to each set that we work, worked on in El Jessica. And we put pieces in a certain order and we'd have an idea of where we were gonna go for that particular set. But there were variable inside of that order that meant that we could on our own bring other things into the equation that were mm -hmm. part of that planning. For instance, if I had a drum solo, I had the choice to improvise or I had the choice to read from various percussion scores that he had given me. Or I had the option to mm -hmm. interpret percussion scores, like look at them and do what I felt when I looked at it. And things like that. And, and, oh, and I would know that I would have an idea that a solo would happen at this point, but sometimes in certain sorts of group situations, there were spontaneous things that happened that weren't really planned, as, as is the nature of improvisation. But mostly there was a general meta structure to the whole yeah. situation. We all pretty much had a handle on it, on what that was. And, and so that we could organize all this music because we had a lot of music. Yeah. To play. <laughs> I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, it does, it does, yeah. It's just like when I listen to that that quartet, or it's just like it seems like it's this this blind telepathy going on, which is basically with any group that you play with, almost like you know, like this long-standing yes, relationship. There's, there's, I guess you know. So, well, I'm, I'm a big believer in that. Yeah. in my life. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the relationships that have span. Um, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years are, are valuable sure. and deep and, and profound. And, and um, so there's, yeah, it's, what can I say? I mean, that's, that's also part of it, but that the, the, we, we endured as four people on the road, a, a lot of things. Oh, sure. Not just the music. We did a lot of things to, you know, we traveled together. We spent time together. We talked a lot. We did, we saw sense. a lot of cities together. We went to the east of Europe a number of times, which was sometimes a bit even dangerous. And yeah, in the we 80s. did a lot of interesting things together. And it was a, it was a, it was a journey. It was a real journey. And yeah. um, his other groups were also as well. They just were more short lived. They just didn't, they didn't go on because the members had other things to do yeah. and it just didn't, it didn't but this group really wanted to be together yeah it seems. was clear and the first time i think in his in the progression of all the things that he did where he found a group that really yes we'll be there for the next tour i'm not about it you know <laughs> absolutely you know and, and we had to it wasn't i have to say it was not it was not easy it was not financially rewarding at all it was uh, it was it was uh, difficult and sure. stressful messy and and uh you know, this is sometimes a, a, a downright disaster but we managed it. we carried on and we we did we did what we did and we gained something from that that's invaluable definitely yeah oh cool thank you sir <laughs> thanks for sharing some of these thoughts jerry appreciate it mm -hmm. beautiful to hear that you know it's just like uh makes the circle round for me or whatever it's not a circle but it's something so <laughs> it's a structure so and i'm hugely grateful for the musicians i've i've been so fortunate to find myself playing with and interacting with and there's um i mean my life is the richer for it of course and the friendships and and yeah. deep um story between let's say based on like with Ray and Mark, these are, this is kind of like my family, you know, like, sure. <laughs> sure. you know, I have a long, long, we have such a, a, a long story. This is how it goes. So it's, it's, I think, which is just us in our personal life and everything. But, but on the other hand, it, it, when it, when it comes to the music and what you hear as a, a, a that that's in the background of it. And, 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 and it's consequent to the, to the, 
what it has developed yep. and, and what, what we can offer. Because you can feel these things when you hear it. And I think that's well, what sure. I, I, that, I hear from your words that you do. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, definitely. I mean, I'm a musician. So I, I, I really, when I listen to music, you know, I, I really listen to like, it's okay. I want to, uh, when I learned, it was like one, one hour or two hours per day. I listened. That was my practice also. And I tell my students, you know, you don't just have to practice and shed technicals. You just listen to, I don't know, Braxton Quartet record, but listen to it. Listen, maybe only what the bass is doing, you know, but we all know that. But when you explain to, to sometimes nowadays when this Insta fast world that we're living in, you know, people have hardly time to listen to a one tune composition, you know. I understand that, of course. And you know what? I mean, we, we, we've changed too. We also. Oh, we did, sure. The uh, uh, FB whatever you like thing kind of world sure. also affects us too sure. so i'm grateful as a i'm also a bit of teacher uh, i'm about to stop um after this next semester uh, oh, wow. i don't know 15 20 years of teaching and i i was teaching first at the new school in new york and for the last 13 years here in Lucerne. and um the thing that maybe the thing I value most, I have to say, about the teaching experiences is the, of the times when <clears throat> I, I teach history a lot. I, I, I sometimes do it formally as a lecture. So for instance, I have a lecture that go, spans the time. In 12 lectures, I cover 1800 to 1960. Mm, it's, well, a, it's not an easy <laughs> thing to do. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> Multimedia um, uh, presentation. I've worked very hard on this lecture, and I've refined it every time I come back to it I refine it a bit more and I think I've picked out all the choice and important points along the way to make you know but I start with things like minstrelsy and banjo music and really understand social history and for a European for the students who are from a completely different culture for whom all of this is you know it's a long time ago on one hand it also understanding slavery and understanding the U.S. Uh, racial situation takes uh, time, um, and it's not easy to absorb. And but I found ways to get it across. I, I, I found the tools that I can get that. Across. But the thing that I wanted to bring up, the only reason I brought this up was because it's the thing I, I so value is that five minutes of listening to a um, a. Uh, Earl Father Hines piano solo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just go, isn't that fucking amazing? <laughs> you know? It is. So, yeah. you know, because sometimes students have, I said, so what has this got to do with us? I said, just don't, don't go there. You just spent five minutes with Earl Father Hines. What, you know, that was a gift. Think about it. And then, you know, eventually it's going to be part of you. Yeah. And, um, you know, the more you take in these things, but those moments where we all sit in a room together and listen, I can't say that's for me, it's one of the real high points of teaching, saying nothing. And I, I mean, I have a lot to say about all these things. And I think I, I, the students value the fact that I'm, they also see I'm very emotionally mm -hmm. involved and they see my passion for it. They get, that you love that's, it too. Yeah. yeah. That's a, that's a model for them. They go, Oh, wow. It's not, yeah, wow, you know, that, that touches them, of course. That's okay. But man, that we actually hear the music in the room together. It gets to the end of the cut and I go, <laughs> what can you say? Yeah. It's just in, outstanding. But we've all been in that room together listening to it. And I think that's huge. Just yeah. sharing music. I think that's huge. Yeah, it's beautifully put. I mean, I have the same experience when I teach... Uh, we always go back to Charlie Christian, let's say, for jazz guitar. And, you know, I, I show them, like, they have to learn some phrases or at least to listen to it. Uh, just play it through, you know, and it's just amazing. You're like, man, that's like 1939 or 41. And it's swinging and it's the lines are incredible. And it's just like the whole vibe when you listen to it, you know, it's just like, listen to it you know it's sound yeah or whatever but the vibe is there the, the whole i love that what, what you're saying now yeah it's it's i feel the same so <laughs> it's beautiful yeah yeah cool. there's many um i mean 
the guitar has a fascinating history of it. I, I, again, like I, of course, Charlie Christian's a valuable um, line, a linear player from, from yeah. and, and what he does and he asks how he also becomes one of the architects of bebop. It's yeah. really fascinating. I'm sure you have these uh, Minton um, recordings. Um, it, the, amazing. Where he it's stretches amazing. out quite a long yeah. time. Yeah, that, yeah. That, those, are, those are very useful for listening. Yeah. And then you have There's Django, one. Django Reinhardt at the same time in Europe, you know, and it's equally, you know, it's a little bit different, but it's the same amount of incredibleness, whatever you want to put it. That's you know, like, do you know that? Well, now we're going to get into it. Do you know the Rex Stewart Quartet record? Sure, sure. Yeah. With, with Talking about <laughs> underrated. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, you know. <laughs> Forget it. I mean, this is the most elegant, most yeah. it's a ridiculous guitar solo on it's just you know yeah. I, I have a transcription of one of them it's just outstanding oh, really? you know oh yeah it's amazing yeah all these guys I mean, like oscar, oscar moore man I like nat king cole oscar absolutely the lines super player. yeah all these guys you know incredible yeah we, yeah anyway <laughs> we could go there <laughs> for a long time but jerry thanks so much oh, man i appreciate it my other loves i, I love oh, really the guitar you play it also i have here i play also but it's not uh I do it for songwriting, but I, oh. um, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I love the, I've always loved the instrument and I've always deeply loved string instruments in general and um, collected all kinds of recordings. From oh, really? Yeah. Lots of different history. I mean, I'm really into the Delta players in particular. They're, they, they they're good. Their ways are very interesting to me. So. Yeah. Rhythm, just, rhythmically, if you, if you check out like what, what they're doing in rhythm, it's incredible. Like yeah. already, like Robert Johnson's. If you transcribe rhythmically what what his flow is of, it's like what? Yeah, it's just amazing. Yeah, I love that many. Yeah, anyway, but. <laughs> Yeah.